Okay, so the device, the recording device in the classroom is still not connecting correctly. So I wasn't able to record this video while we were doing the lecture. So I'm just going to kind of go over everything we did in class today so that anyone that missed class can hopefully follow along and still get the same content. Okay, or if you're just reviewing the material, you can come back here and review everything um, to see where everything came from. Okay. So this is just a summary of the formulas that we had before. So if we have distinct eigenvalues, distinct lambdas, then we have term for each one of those lambdas and they fit this form. So one of your lambdas with its appropriate eigenvector and then another lambda with its eigenvector and if you had a third, the third with its lambda um, with this vector. Now if you have repeated, it depends on how many times your thing repeats. If you just have the, the eigenvalue once, that term looks a lot like the distinct term, right? Because it just shows up once. But if you have a term that repeats twice, then you'll have two terms here like this. And if you have a, um, a lambda that repeats three times, then you'll have one, two, and three terms. Now these really should be brackets because K and P themselves are matrices, which means K and P will have parentheses. So this really should be brackets right here. Okay. Um, and if I had a fourth, which we don't because we, um, the most that we ever deal with is a three by three. So the only time you'll see repeated is if you have two repeated where you don't have this third term or you may have a three by three matrix which has three repeating ver um, eigenvalues and so then you would have that third term, okay? Now if you only have two, an eigenvalue that appears twice, you only need to find the K that goes with it and the P that goes with it. However, if you have an eigenvalue that repeats three times, you'll have to find K first, use K to find P, and then use P to find Q. <coughs> Excuse me. Now here I've summarized the complex. This is how the general solution should be mapped out. Um, we do have to simplify the general solution just a little bit. And I think in the original notes when I put the formula for this, I think these two were backwards. So this one with B1 plus B2 was labeled as X1 and B2 minus B1 was labeled as X2. Okay, it doesn't matter which one they're in. All that means is that this term will be in the back and that term will be in the front, but both terms should be there and should match whatever's in the back of the book. Okay, um, and then we just distinguish down here what capital B1 meant and what capital B2 meant. Capital B meant, B1 meant the real coefficients of K1 and then B2 is the imaginary coefficients of K1. So in all, no matter what, but this and this should just be some constants with no i's whatsoever so that when you plug everything in there's no longer any i's or imaginaries that go with it okay so let's jump into the first problem we have about four examples um, so we're gonna get through all of them um, and it might be a little bit quicker than it was in class in class it took us the entire two hours here it might not be as um, much okay so the first thing we always do to find the eigenvalues is take the determinant of a minus um, lambda I equal to zero. So five minus lambda, negative four, zero, zero, zero minus lambda is just negative lambda, two, zero, two, and then five minus lambda. And we apply the technique on how we find a determinant of a three by three. And so we ended up with this line here. <coughs> Again, all of the ones going downward will have a positive in front and all of the ones going upward from left to right will have a minus in front of those. Now we did notice that every single term that was left, you know, if you pretend that these guys are not there, um, all of the terms that are left all had a five minus alpha or a five minus lambda in them. Therefore, we factored that five minus lambda out. And if we're factoring one five minus lambda out, we basically end up with negative lambda times this other five minus lambda. We end up with negative four and we end up with negative negative four. 
This is negative plus 4, which wipe each other out. And so all you have left inside the bracket is negative lambda times 5 minus lambda. So I just put the monomial out in the front, because typically when you're writing things in a proper manner, your monomials should be in the front, then this binomial here, and then that binomial there. So when I set this factor equal to 0, I get 0. When I set this factor equal to 0, I get 5. When I set this factor equal to 0, I get 5. So we noticed we had one that was different from the others, but we had two that were repeating. So that means in order for me to find both of the solutions that go with this, I need to find k, but then I also need to find p, okay? And the way you put those together is different. You're not just going to say k times e to the 5t and p times e to the 5t. You have to follow this formula. This is what the first one will look like. This is what the second term will look like. So it's not just first term has a K, second term has a P. First term does have a K, but the second term has a K and a P. Okay? So be careful that you're following that formula when it comes to the repeated uh, eigenvalues. So then we went ahead and tried to figure out what K was. So to do that, we had to solve A minus lambda I k equal to 0. And we had to plug in 5 for lambda since that's the lambda we're dealing with. So we went back to this matrix inside the parentheses and just plugged in a 5 here, plugged in a 5 there, and plugged in a 5 there. And so this is the matrix that we ended up with here. Now in order to solve this, we swapped these two rows so that the 1 could be in the top. And then we went on to try to make this term of 1 so we did negative 1 fourth R2, and we got this line here. The top and bottom stayed the same. Then we used that 1 to make the bottom a 0. So we did negative 2 times row 2 plus row 3. Row 3 is the one that will get replaced. So top and middle row stayed the same. Bottom row becomes 0, 0, 0, 0. Now we put this into the equations. So this is K1 minus 5k2 plus 2k3 equal to 0. The middle line is 1k2 equals 0. So then over here, I move these two terms over. <coughs> Actually, no, I didn't. I plugged in 0 for k2 first. And when you do that, you get k1 plus k3 equals 0 because this term would just be a big fat zero, which pretty much makes it disappear. Then I minus the 2k3 two, the two over. So we can't let k3 equal zero, because if we do, k1 will also equal zero, and k2 is zero. So that would make all of them zero. So then instead, we let k3 be the common denominator, and the common denominator here happens to just be 1 because there are no denominators. So we let k3 equal 1. Then that would mean that k1 is equal to negative 2. And k2 we already know is equal to 0. So then our, our matrix here, our vector, becomes negative 2, 0, 1 for that lambda. But we had that lambda twice, right? Which means we now also need to find the p. And in order to find the p, you use the same left-hand side. That part's going to be exactly the same because it's the exact same lambda. The only thing that's changing is instead of putting zeros on the right-hand side, you now have to put the answers you found for k. So we have to put the negative 2, 0, 1 that we just found for k. <clears throat> so then once we had that, we swapped the top and middle again. Then we did negative 1 fourth row 2 again and we ended up with this. And then we tried to get this back to 0 so we did negative 2 r2 plus row 3. Row 3 being the one that gets replaced. And we ended up with this and then we put it back into our equations. So p1 because of my variables here are p's. So p1 minus 5p2 plus oh and I made a mistake. This is 2. So this should have been plus 2 P3. And then the next equation is P2 
equals one half. So I don't have a choice. P2 is going to equal one half. The only thing is, is that right here, this should be two P3. So then I get two P3. So if P2 is one half, I plugged in one half for P2 over here in the top equation, which means I got negative one half um, plus two P3. And if I move over both of these terms to the other side, this is still going to be 2P3. Now, here you can let P3 equal 0 because P2 is not 0. So they won't all be 0. So I let P3 equal 0, which means this would be 0, and then that would still be 5 halves. So somehow, coincidentally, we still ended up with the same um, P and it still works. Okay. The other thing um, is that we have to put this together. Okay. And we'll put that together later. The last thing we need to do is figure out what K goes with our lambda equals zero. So this is going to be a different K than the K we just found. So I called it K2. Then we're plugging in zero for lambda. <coughs> Excuse me. So if I go here and I plug in zero for lambda, the matrix we end up with is this, and we are solving a regular distinct, so they do turn back to zeros. We're not doing a repeated where that changes. So we swap the top and middle, and then we tried to get a zero here, so we did negative five row one plus row two, and we got this there. We tried to get the one in the middle by doing negative one-fourth R2, ended up with this. And then we tried to get the zero down here, so we did negative two R2 plus row three. Row three being the one that's getting replaced. And then we ended up with this. So we put it back into our equations. One K1 plus two K3 equals zero. K2 plus five halves K3 equals zero. So we moved it over, K3 is the arbitrary guy, so we let K3 be the common denominator, because if you let K3 equal zero, then K2 is zero, and then K1 is zero, and then they're all zero. So we had to do the common denominator, which was two, which meant that K1 was negative four, and K2 would be negative five. So there's my K for lambda equal to zero. So for my distinct factor, or no, sorry, the repeated part, we're using our formula. C1, K1, E to the lambda T, plus C2, K1, T, E to the lambda T, plus P, E to the lambda T. And for the lambda equal to zero, we have C3 equal to K2 times E to the lambda T, which is zero. Well, e to the zero is just one, so you really don't need to write that part of the term on this last term here, which is why I got lazy and I just boxed all of that, because that is the final answer, okay? Since you're just basically multiplying all of those items in this matrix by a one, they're gonna stay the same. <clears throat> So then now we have the second example, example five in the whole 10.2 section. So here is our matrix. We're starting again doing determinant of I, A minus lambda I. So we subtracted lambda from all the identities. We did our determinant. We ended up with this. These all went away. So we basically got lambda equal to four, lambda equal to four, lambda equal to four. So we've got repeated situation going on here, but we have three that are repeating, which means we're gonna to need to find a K, a P, and a Q, and make sure that you're using that formula base to find the three different solutions, okay? Because the first, the solution to this will just involve K. The solution to this will, call, will involve K and P, and the solution for this one will involve K, P, and Q. So make sure that you're using that formula and not just saying that vector gives you a solution here, this vector gives you a solution there, and this vector gives you a solution there. Because it's not single-handed like that, okay? So the first thing we need to do is start with the K. 
So we solve this with k equal to 0. So if I plug in 4, because my lambda is 4 for all of them, if I plug in 4 here, here, and here, I'm going to end up with this matrix. And then you notice there's nothing to solve there. So k2 is 0, k3 is 0. That means k1 cannot be 0, so we let k1 equal 1. And we ended up with capital K as this vector here. Now to find P, the left-hand side of the matrix is going to stay the same, but the right-hand side is going to turn into what you got for K. And again, there's nothing to solve there. It's already in its simplest form. So P2 equals 1, P3 equals 0. And why am I using P's? Because that's my variable here is P. These are just a bunch of numbers. Then, <clears throat> excuse me, that means that since P2 is 1, I can let P1 be 0 because they won't all be 0. So then we get capital P is 0, 1, 0. Now for us to find Q, again, the left-hand side of the matrix stays the same, but the right-hand side becomes the P, so 0, 1, 0. Then the top line reads Q2 equals 0. The middle line reads Q3 equals 1. So that leaves me with Q1 to figure out. And since I have this guy that's not 0, it won't be 0, I can let Q1 equal 0 without them all turning to 0. So we end up with Q is 0, 0, 1. Okay? That's another page. There we go. <coughs> so how do I put all that information together? Remember, the first solution is just C1 times K e to the lambda t. 14. The second one is C2 times k t e to the lambda t plus p e to the lambda t. And then the, finally the third term is C3 k t squared over 2 e to the lambda t plus p t e to the lambda t plus q e to the lambda t. So that should be a 4t up there. And that whole thing is the final answer. <clears throat> so you have three solutions for a 3 by 3. And you notice with the C1, C2, C3 that all three solutions are there. The next example is this one here. So we've got a 2 by 2, which is not going to be as extensive as the other ones. Um, but I'm, there's I's involved, so it may still be a little tedious here. So take the determinant of this matrix there. So we get this here equal to 0. We multiplied that out. We put a plus 2, combined our like terms. We ended up with this. We solved for lambda, and we got that lambda was plus or minus i. So then we solve this for k. Now with complex, you only need to find k, and then you're going to break it up into its real parts and imaginary parts, and then use the formulas. So we only need to find k. We only need to solve the matrix once. So I plugged in i, so this became 1 minus i and negative 1 minus i. And that's what I have here with the zero zeros. So we swapped row 2 and row 1. Then we went ahead and multiplied row 1 by negative 1 half, which ended up with this. And then we wanted to make this 0, so we did negative 1 plus i times row 1. Um, plus row 2. So this is all of my work to figure out what that was going to look like. So 1 times negative 1 plus i is just negative 1 plus i. But 1 half plus 1 half i times negative 1 plus i, that we had to foil out. And when we did, we got negative 1 half, positive 1 half i, negative 1 half i, positive one-half i squared, which means this one turned into a negative one-half. And negative one-half and negative one-half is a negative one. So this is all just my side work here, okay? This here is negative i plus, or negative one plus i row, times row one. This is what I end up with. And if I put row two right underneath that, right? This is row two. If I put all of those items underneath that, I've got to add it together. So I get 0, 0, and 0, which means the whole bottom row, row 2, is going to become 0, 0, 0. 
Now, if I want to write this in equations, that's k1 equals this thing times k2. You can move the whole thing over, but when you do, this plus in the front becomes a minus. Another way of doing that is just changing both of the signs, so it becomes negative 1 half minus 1 half i times k2. So you can't let k2 equal 0, because then 0 times this would mean k1 is also 0, and both can't be 0. So we let k2 be the common denominator, which means that then the 2's would go away and I'd end up with negative 1 minus i as k1. <coughs> so that means that capital K is then going to be negative 1 minus i over 2 for lambda equal to 1. Well, I have to identify the alpha and the beta for this complex number. That complex number can be written like this, no real part plus a 1 coefficient of i which means alpha is zero and beta is one. My b1 and my b2 that are part of my formulas is the real coefficients of k, which is negative one and two. b2 is the imaginary coefficients of k. The coefficient here is negative one. There is no imaginary component here, so it's zero. And then k1 is going to be, and you can swap these. It doesn't matter what label you have them on, okay? But what's important is that if you put b2 in front, there has to be a minus here. If you put b1 in front, there has to be a plus there, okay? So we plugged everybody in. It should be b2 cosine of beta t minus b1 times sine of beta t, whole thing multiplied by e to the alpha t, which this is just the one, so you don't even need to really write it. Then beta 1, or b1 times cosine beta t plus b2 sine of beta t times e to the alpha t. Again, you don't need to write this term. But we do need to simplify x1 and x2 so that it's just one matrix. So when you do this, it's negative cosine of t, a negative and a negative will be plus sine of t. Bottom row, no cosines, but you do have negative 2 sine of t which is this term here. For x2, you have negative cosine of t, and you have negative sine of t. At the bottom, you have two cosine t and no sine t's, so that's just this guy here. So the general solution is gonna be c1 times x1, which is that there, and c2 times x2, which is that there. If you chose different labels here and here, if you called this one x1 and you called that one x2, all it means is that that term will be in the front and this term will be in the back. It doesn't matter what order they're in, just as long as both those matrices are there in your final answer. Okay, this was the very last example that we covered, um, and this was the one that was the most difficult out of all of them because there was a lot going on in this problem. A lot of different things were happening in this particular problem. So first thing we did was we did the determinant of a minus lambda i, and so we pulled it all out here. Now because this did not have any of these terms in common, and not, not that one so much either, we did have to multiply everything out. So we multiplied these two together and got this. This just came down, multiplied those signs together, that came down, multiplied the negative three in and we got this. Foiled that out some more, we ended up with all of these terms. Combined our like terms, we ended up with all of this. I don't particularly like my leading coefficient to be negative, so I divided everybody by a negative one, and then I ended up with this. And then we would have to factor that. <clears throat> and the fastest way to figure out how to factor that is to use your possible um, solutions theorem or possible zeros theorem and then um, plug them in to see which ones actually work. So we take the factors of the back guy, which are 1, 3, 5, and 15, divide by the factors of the front coefficient, which is just 1. So if I take each one of these and put them over 1, I get these four numbers here. However, the signs can vary. So in actuality, there's actually eight possibilities of numbers that I can get here, okay, of lambdas that will actually work. 
Now what we did was we plugged them into this equation right here. Okay, so we plugged one here, here, and here, and see and saw if we got zero, and we didn't. Then we plugged in negative one here, here, and here, and saw if that would give us zero, and it didn't. Then we plugged in positive three here, here, and here, and saw if that would give us zero, and it didn't. Then we plugged in negative three here, here, and here, and that actually did give us zero. So negative three was the one that worked which means lambda should be negative three, okay? But I need to factor this polynomial here in order to figure out what the other lambdas will be because I have a cubic, which means I should have three lambdas. So we did synthetic division to help us factor it. So we put the negative three that worked and we put all the coefficients, positive one, positive one, negative one, and 15. And then we did our synthetic division. So we brought the one down, one times negative three is negative three. Combine these, you get negative two. Negative two times negative three is positive six. Combine these, you get positive five. Positive five times negative three is negative 15. Combine these and you get zero. Zero being your remainder. So this is what you have left. So you have x minus this guy right here times one lambda squared minus two lambda plus five. That's just a remainder. So then um, I cleaned that up, the negative, negative, made it to a positive, and then if you set this equal to zero, you get this. If you set that equal to zero, you can't factor it, which means you have to do the quadratic formula. So after all of the quadratic formula, we ended up with the other two answers being one plus two i and one minus two i. <clears throat> This is where some more fun began. If you were in class today, you'll know this is where I started losing people because it was a bit much, okay? You've got to go back to here and remember that you're plugging in one plus two i. So if I take two minus a one plus two i, really what you're doing is you're subtracting one and you're subtracting two i, which is why I ended up with one minus two i and I ended up with this entire matrix there, okay? So go back to this. So two minus one minus two i, two minus one is one, and the minus two i is there. These two terms stayed the same. This term stayed the same. Here you have a negative. So negative one and negative two i, which is this here. Six stayed the same. Negative four the same, zero the same. Here we had negative three, minus one, minus two i. Well, negative three and negative one are negative four, and then there's the minus two i. <clears throat> and so then here, we started trying to figure out how we were gonna do this. We tried to make this thing real first by multiplying by its conjugate, um, and then we saw where that left us. So if I multiply this times one plus two i, we ended up with five. If I multiply one times one plus two i, I ended up with one plus two i. And if I multiply two times one plus two i, I ended up with two plus four i. So each of those items was replaced by their multiples, okay? Then we noticed that these two are opposite signs and could probably get some zeros. So we did r1 plus r2, and we decided to replace r1. So when we added those two together, we got eight, we got zero, and we got eight plus four i, and then of course we got zero. Then we noticed that, um, that this and this were multiples of each other. So we multiplied the bottom times two, added it to the top, replacing the top. So two times that is negative eight plus eight, which is zero, zero and zero is zero. Two times these guys are negative eight and negative four i. When you add, combine them with those, you get zero and zero and zero, of course, is zero, okay? Then we went ahead and swapped the rows around. So we wanted the zero, zero, zeros at the very bottom, and then we also decided to put the positive three at the top, therefore putting the negative four row at the middle. So the whole row stays intact. We're just swapping out the rows. 
basically rewriting which equation we want on top, which equation we want in the middle, and which equation we want at the bottom, okay? Then we wanted to make that three of one, so we did one third times our one, and we ended up with these values. And then we wanted to make this guy a zero, so we did four times row one plus row two. And once we did that, we ended up with these items here. And then we had to turn this into a one, so we multiplied by the conjugate in hopes of getting it to be a real number first. And the real number we ended up with was 80 over nine. If you wanna pause here and look at all the distributing and how that all worked out, you can. But we ended up getting 80 over nine here. When we multiply that times this, right, we ended up with 40 over three i, which was this here. And when you multiply um, the zero, and you add the one, it just stayed, or I'm sorry, we were only dealing with row two. So zero times that conjugate is still zero, and zero times that conjugate is still zero. So then we wanted to make the 80 over nine a one. So we multiplied by nine over 80, and we ended up with this. And then from here, we went ahead and put it into our equations. So we got K1 equals, um, this should have been, I actually moved it over. I moved these two over for K2 and I moved this over for K3. So it became positive one third, positive two thirds times K2 and then negative two times K3. I moved that one over so it became negative three halves I K3. So we let K3 equal a common denominator because if we had let it be zero, K2 would be zero, which means both of these would be zero. So then K1 would also be zero, which can't happen. So we let it be the common denominator. Between threes and twos, the common denominator was best to be a um, six. So then K2 was negative three halves I times six which was negative 9i, and then k1 would have been 1 third plus 2 thirds i times that k2, negative 9i, minus 2 times that 6. So that's what we have written out here. We distributed that 9i, got these two terms, turned that into a minus 12, combined our like terms, well, we changed this into a negative 1, which changed that sign to a plus. And then we went ahead and combined our like terms and we for K1. So K1 goes on top, K2 in the middle, K3 at the bottom. And that's the K we got for one plus two I. So the alpha here is one and the beta here is two. The real coefficients are negative six, zero, and six. The imaginary coefficients are negative three, negative nine, and zero. So we plugged them into our x's. We've got b2 cosine of beta 2, 2t, minus b1 sine of beta, all times e to the alpha t. And then same thing here, b1 cosine of 2t plus b2 times sine of 2t. And then e to the alpha t. Then here we just did top row and bottom row. So negative three cosine of 2t, that turns into positive six sine of two t. Here there's no cosines, but you have negative nine. Ah, that should be negative nine. Oh no, I'm looking at the wrong one. Top, x1, right? Negative three cosine, positive six sine. Then negative nine cosine, and then no signs. And then no cosines, but negative six sine. So that's what we have there. All times e to the t. One t is just t. Then over here, we've got negative six cosine of two t, negative three sine of two t. Here we have no cosines, but we have negative nine sine of two t. And then here we have six cosine of two t and no sines. So that's what we've got there, times e to the t. Now before we put these two into the answer, c1 times this, c2 times this, we have a third answer, right? <coughs> Aside from the imaginaries, we also had a um, lambda equal to negative three. So we still have to solve the matrix for the lambda equal to three. So we went back to the matrix before we did the determinant. 
we went back here and we plugged in negative 3 for lambda. So 2 minus negative 3, negative negative 3, and negative 3 minus negative 3. And we ended up with this matrix here. So we swapped the top and the middle, and we did 1 third times row 2 at the same time. So 1 third of this, 1 third of that, 1 third of that, 1 third of that is up at the top. And then the top row is in the middle, and the bottom row is at the bottom. Then we did negative or positive 4 row 1 plus row 3, replacing row 3, and we ended up with this. Then we did negative 5 row 1 plus row 2, replacing row 2. And then we did negative 1 fourth times row 2, so we ended up with this line. And then we did negative 4 times row 2 plus row 3, replacing row 3, and we ended up with this. And then we put it back into our equations. So k1 plus k2 plus 2k3 equals 0, k2 plus 2k3 equals 0, k1 equals negative k2, negative 2k3, and k2 will equal negative 2k3. So you can't let k3 equal 0 because then k2 would be 0, and if both of these are 0, then k1 would be 0. So we let it be the common denominator, which was 1. Then that means k2 is negative 2, and k1 is going to be negative negative 2 minus 2 times 1, which turned out to be positive 2 minus 2, which was 0. So we got 0, negative 2, and 1 for the vector. So we got c1 equal to x1 from the previous, plus c2 equal to x2 from the previous lambda. And then now we have this third solution, which is c3 times this vector e to the lambda t. And that's all three of the solutions for the 3 by 3 matrix. Now just a quick mention, um, we are finished with the lecture. This is the end of new material. For the next um, few days, this is what it's going to look like. So we have class on 1126. We have class on 12-3, and we have class 12-5, and then we have our final exam on 12-12. So on the 26th, if you turned in your Chapter 8 homework, you can correct it and turn it again. Or if you didn't turn it in, you can still turn it in, but it will be considered as corrections. Okay. When you turn it in, you can get 80% of the points lost. So. Those that didn't turn it in entirely can get the highest grade you can get as an 80, okay? Those who only had one or two problems or maybe three or four to correct, um, you can still get 80% of those back. So here's the chapter eight homework corrections are due. If you didn't turn your homework in in the last class, then you are doing homework corrections even if it's the first time you're turning it in, okay? And we're going to practice this 10.2 material. Okay, that's what's happening next Tuesday. Nothing will be recorded, nothing will be posted. So if you want to get the most out of that class, you need to attend. On the third, we're going to go over the second half of the final review which is basically chapter 8 and chapter 10. Okay, and this is the day that the chapter 10 homework will be due. So you'll get some practice with it and then you're gonna have to turn in the homework that following a week after Thanksgiving. Then on this day, we're going to be, this is our last class, we're gonna do the first half of the final review, which covers chapter 2, 3, and 4, okay? So the, we'll kind of review all of the old material, what, what, what's the good stuff that we're going to need from all of that old material for the test, okay? And then on 12-12, same classroom, same time, 10 o'clock, is going to be your final exam. So that's the end of it. We've got three weeks left, and this is it. This is Thanksgiving week, this is the following week, and then this is final exams week. And we are done. So keep working hard, get your homework knocked out, try to get as most points as possible. Um, 
so we can keep pushing forward and everybody can hopefully pass the class.